Previously on the British Broadcasting Century Podcast. 1922, what a year. In January, the Postmaster General says he'll allow 15 minutes of speech and music alongside 15 minutes of Morse. In February, 2MT Riddle launches the first regular British broadcasting. In March, Peter Eckersley seizes the mic and wins over the hearts, minds and ears of the nation. In April, Reith leaves Scotland for London. In May, Marconi's begins a second station, 2LO London, and Metrovic begins 2ZY Manchester competition. In June, the Postmaster General insists the companies get along. In July, the companies decide to form not two Two companies, but one. In August, the BBC is formed. In September, there's a big wireless exhibition to sell radios to the masses. In October, the press problem is hammered out. In November, the BBC launches. In December, the first four staff are hired. What a year! This time, year's end. The sun sets on British Broadcasting's birth year. We'll bring you the programming for the first BBC New Year's Eve, including the voices of those who rang the year out. To be the last in the year 1922 to speak to you is a responsibility before which the most confident might quake. No Big Ben's bongs just yet, though. Just the end of the beginning, and the end of season two, pretty much, of this podcast. Plus our special guest, BBC Radio Norfolk's Paul Hayes, who will tell of his new book on Doctor Who. Not all Doctor Who fans, but a certain type of Doctor Who fan has an insatiable curiosity about how the series works, a desire to, to open up the bonnet and, and see what goes on in there and find out about the history of it and how it was put together. And uh, Russell T. Davis once wrote that in the future, Doctor Who will be the case study for how British television drama was made because it is almost certainly the most studied uh, British television drama series ever. The, the, there are books and articles and documentaries on almost any aspect of its history that you could care to mention in great deal. And so many Doctor Who fans go on to become interested and to write about, to study the wider history of British television and British broadcasting. It is very much that that gateway drug into BBC history and television history and, and, and broadcasting history for a lot of people, and, and I'm definitely one of those. So set your TARDIS for New Year's Eve 1922 and travel back with us 99 years on the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling... This is London Calling. Hello, hello, British Broadcasting Century Calling, for sort of the last time in Season 2. What, I hear you cry? There's a little gap there for you to cry what, if you'd like. Well, you shouldn't notice much change, really. Season 2 is just a name. You see, my original plan was to call this Season 2 all the way until the end of 1923. We are telling the origin story of British broadcasting incredibly slowly. But now we've reached the end of 1922. It does kind of feel narratively like there's a change coming in this fledgling British broadcasting so for 10 episodes or so, we've been covering the pre-Reith BBC. You know, the BBC had launched, Reith hadn't really joined or started yet, the pre-Magnet House BBC, the make-it-up-as-you-go-along BBC. So I feel that we should mark the move to the Reith era, which really begins at the start of New Year 1923, with a new season on the podcast. Season three. It's a line in the sand as they cross the threshold into the new year and into Magnet House. So here's the plan. You will recall that we had a few specials on the podcast between seasons one and two. Well, I think we'll have at least one special then, marking the gap between seasons two and three. I've got a few ideas lined up. I'll tell you more about them as they form in my brain. So next time, we've got one ready and waiting, which is going to be summarising the stories so far. You may have heard it on the History of England podcast, but I'll be adding a few extra bits as well. So it's essentially... The entire podcast we've done so far told in half an hour. That's for next time. Meanwhile, though, one more episode of season two then to round things off. This one on the first BBC New Year. We've got some lovely clips to play you and some nice little takes on what the provincial stations were broadcasting just a few weeks into their existence. Plus, bang up to date, we'll be chatting to Paul Hayes, friend of the show, radio producer and presenter and author of The Long Game, 1996 to 2003, the inside story of how the BBC brought back Doctor Who. It's an era of Doctor Who's history I've always been fascinated by. It's an era I, I grew up through. So the reason we started in 1996 is because that's when there was the first attempt to revive Doctor Who with, with a TV movie. And I was 12 years old then. And then when it, it did finally, when the recommission happened in September 2003, 
I was 19, I was in my second year at university. So going from 12 to 19, that seems like a lifetime in and of itself. Uh, there'd been all various documentaries and articles and interviews down the years that had told bits and pieces of this story. Uh, but I never felt there was something that uh, pulled the whole story together into one narrative and put it into context, explained what the changes had been over the BB at the BBC over those years, how particularly the drama department and BBC One had changed, provided, you know, the, the change of era from John Burt to Greg Dyke, which was hugely important in this story. Doctor yeah. Who sort of just comes along just in time at the end of the Greg Dyke era to really benefit from that. I mean, he'd gone by the time it reached the screen, but it just benefits from that, that influx of confidence and money. Well, the money had come from Burt. Burt had got the licence fee settlement but dyke was yeah. able to use that money so as well as weaving all the elements of the story together i wanted to write something that would uh, explain a bit of that that background and, and context order your copy now more on paul hayes and his new doctor who book coming up but first we open our tardis doors on to december 30th 1922 <laughs> Yes, so let's get underway with our story of the week then. It's New Year's Eve Eve, which is actually where we were last episode. It's John Reed's first day of work, if you remember. Well, one thing we didn't mention last time is that he ended his first day in charge by writing a letter to his former best friend and perhaps one-time lover, Charlie Bowser. You can see episode 15 of this podcast, John Reith Mastermind, for details of Charlie and John Reith and their whole backstory. Charlie was Reith's best friend and then some. Reith was always finding Charlie deputy roles in every job that Reith worked in, from the army to Beardsmore's Glasgow factory. Reith wanted Charlie Bowser by his side. Until, that is, they had a massive falling out over, you guessed it, women. They both got married and maybe they were never destined to. Reith's wife Muriel seemed to fit in okay into this kind of well, threesome, I suppose, between John and Charlie. They both loved her. It's said that Charlie loved Muriel even more than John Reith did, and John was the one who married her. But when Charlie married a woman, who Reith nicknamed Jezebel, well, it drove a bit of a wedge between the two men. Still, John Reith always wrote to Charlie on his birthday, as he did late in 1922, and he got a rather blunt reply from Charlie. Smug little cad, Reith wrote in his diary after that first day of work on December 30th. Of course, if only things had been otherwise, he could have been assistant general manager of this new concern. Yes, Reith had left Charlie behind. If they hadn't had such a falling out, I've got no doubt that Charlie would have been deputy general manager, deputy director general, second in command at the BBC to begin with. That Reith era BBC, I'm sure, would have been somewhat different then, possibly more relaxed. John Reith did seem to kick into this puritanical leadership model. But then would he have been like that with Charlie by his side? I don't know. Instead, the number two job of the BBC would ultimately go later in 1923 to Admiral Charles Carpendale. This is a man who'd come from the Navy and therefore he saw each BBC building as a ship with decks and crewmates. Some say that Broadcasting House was even constructed that way. And you can see, new Broadcasting House today does still look like a small ocean liner with a Starbucks. But Charlie was not destined to be part of it. He was off with his Scottish heiress that he'd married and broken up that Charlie Bowser-John Reith friendship. I can be unforgiving. There are some people whom I will not forgive. We anyhow haven't forgiven yet. Reith gloated about what Charlie had missed out on because, yeah, Reith was one to hold a grudge throughout his life and career. I have a blacklist. Um, there are only about eight people on it for all my long life. It, it isn't the same eight. I mean, one somebody goes off, you see, one year. Somebody else goes off the next year because I've managed to persuade myself at long last that there was a fault on my side. That's at least honest, isn't it? I try hard to persuade myself that it was more my fault than I could have realised. All right, then the man comes off. But some, somebody new maybe comes on. But on a more optimistic note, as 1922 drew to a close, the BBC was booming. Demand for licences was skyrocketing. By December the 31st, 35,774 licences were issued by the General Post Office. And, yep, there were just four employees. John Reith, Arthur Burroughs, Cecil Lewis and Major Anderson. And that was one of those stats that lured me into this story. When I first heard it, I thought, who were those four employees? 
Well, over the past 36 episodes, we have been starting to find out. Reith in charge, Anderson on admin, Burroughs and Lewis manning the program department and rushing from head office to the studio every single day. And of course, that statistic of four staff members doesn't give the full picture of the provincial stations. Now, they weren't technically BBC staff at this point. They were, at this stage, employees of wireless firms like Marconi's, General Electric, Metrovic. But they were running BBC stations. Like this lineup on December the 30th, as printed in the Derby Daily Telegraph. Birmingham, 6.30pm Children's Stories. 7pm, 9.45 News, 7.15 to 8.30 and 9 to 9.45, a concert. Miss Ethel Richardson, soprano, Mr H. Nusser, alto, Mr R. C. Richards, baritone, Mr A. Ralph, solo piano, Mr M. Cook on cornet, Mr V. Saul, cor anglais, and Mr J. Rickards, comedian. London has a concert, 5pm to 10.30pm, with intervals. 2ZY Manchester, 5.55 call-up, 6pm concert, 6.15 news, well it's a short concert, 6.30 more concert, 8 to 9pm concert again, a bit vague on who's on, 9.15 late news, 9.25 to 10pm concert again. The Paris and Hague stations also appear in the listings with more concerts. It's not just British broadcasting you can hear on British sets. As for New Year's Eve, the Birmingham station had their station boss Percy Edgar give his famous Dickens and the English trio. Mr C. By on violin, Mr F. By on cello, presumably their brothers, and Mr W. Ridgeway on piano, Miss Beatrice Baker soprano and Miss Dorothy McKenna contralto. So this was New Year's Eve, of course, and the Boston Guardian later reported of Birmingham's contributions on December the 31st. Birmingham, by the way, closed down at 10.30, with no little regret that it was not possible to shake hands. But all the same, the best of all wishes was broadcasted. The station staff, with the artists, joined in the singing of Old Lang Syne. Just a little early, but at half past ten. Both London and Manchester reopened at 11.50. Manchester bade farewell to the old year by tolling a bell, and Chopin's funeral march was played as a piano forte solo. Then, after a brief pause, the station clock chimed midnight, and a merry peal followed. As for 5 and 0 Newcastle, open less than a week, of course, they said goodbye to the stable yard and hello to their new studios in Eldon Square on December the 29th. That was a good mile from the transmitter and connected by phone line. Popular Wireless stated, As no regular artists are engaged, the vocal and instrumental sections at present are given by the members of the Amateur Dramatic Society, giving great satisfaction to a widely spread audience. Transmissions start at 6.30 each evening. And it sounds like they were on air for New Year at midnight. The Newcastle Daily Chronicle stated, The New Year was ushered in from the Newcastle Broadcasting Station. A special message was sent out and during the evening a special concert was released. At Walker's Wireless Station in Westgate Road, gramophone concerts were given and attracted large crowds. Now Walker's was a shop selling radio kit and our newspaper detective Andrew Barker found an ad for that shop. They would put on wireless concerts from the station relayed to a large crowd by Walker's wireless loud speaking attachment. Get yours here. But as for London's New Year broadcasting, well, I will tell you that in a mo. But first, a guest. Let's welcome to the podcast Paul Hayes, producer, presenter, radio enthusiast and radio history enthusiast as well. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes, I think so. I think I have to give I've made a few documentaries about um, radio down the years. It would be uh, uh, stupid of me to deny that. I, I would say maybe more specifically BBC history enthusiast, probably, because the, the history of the BBC, I mean, I'm interested in broadcasting history generally, but particularly the history of the BBC has uh, been a source of fascination for me almost ever since I can remember, really. Your documentaries we talked about on the podcast already in previous weeks, Nexus, about uh, the Norfolk TV station. Also, you did the package for us a few episodes ago now about first football commentaries. Oh, yes, Jimmy Jewell. Yes, well, Jimmy I, Jewell. I, yeah, I, I suppose I enjoy telling stories about aspects of broadcasting history that, that maybe haven't been as widely told by other people. So this year of Doctor Who, as I say, uh, bits and pieces have been written about, different elements have been, have been written about and told about, but I didn't feel there was anything that, that drew the whole story together and provided that context. And yes, I've, when I've made documentaries, which I've been very fortunate to do, yeah, the Jimmy Jewell one, I just thought that was a very interesting story. He was the BBC's first regular television football commentator, the man before Kenneth Wilson home. And um, a lot of people say, I mean, when, when Kenneth Wilson home died, and that, no... 
you know, less impeachable a source than the great Barry Davis said in his obituary on the BBC News. Oh, he was the first television football commentator. I love you, Barry, but he wasn't the first television football commentator. Uh, Jewel wasn't either, but Jewel was the first regular one, the first person to do the job regularly. And, and, and he had such an interesting life. He'd been a pilot on aircraft carriers in the First World War, one of, one of the first pilots to fly from aircraft carriers. He'd uh, refereed a cup final. He'd been a linesman at a game, uh, at the Olympic football tournament in 1936 with Hitler watching. Uh, he'd been in the RAF again during the Second World War and, and possibly managed England during the Second World War. I was never able to prove that, but it seems likely he managed England in at least one of their wartime games. And he just seemed to have this fascinating life that no one had really written about or done anything about so yeah these stories that they haven't been told before have not been widely told i think are quite fun to you, you find yourself a little niche and uh yeah. and, and hopefully tell a story that not as many people are familiar with well with all of these i get the impression that you you sort of wish you were there working in, <laughs> in those elements of broadcasting Ooh, these broadcasting moments where where I, would you put yourself in in broadcasting history if you could be working <laughs> across any uh anywhere I don't know. I mean, almost it almost wouldn't be necessarily working there as maybe just sort of like being uh, uh, like Scrooge with the spirits, just an observer, seeing it all happen. Because for some of these documentaries, I've had to transfer stuff off tape. It's a nightmare. I would not have wanted to. Have, I know they say, oh, you're used to what you, you know, if I would grown up in the era of tape, I wouldn't have been, uh, you know, I wouldn't have missed computer editing because I've been used to it. But I mean, I've used tape to take stuff off for archive. I've, tried, I've had to thread through those we- reels and things. I've never had to edit on tape. Thank goodness. Uh, you know, <laughs> slicing and, and t- I know a lot of people have a, have a great romance about that. I don't. I'm quite happy to be in the year of digital editing. So there is always a worry, isn't there, that, you know, we can look back with rose tinted spectacles and think it was all much better, particularly those of us who are interested in history and heritage broadcasting. I mean, I remember reading a book, which I think you've got, I forget what it is now. It's that one John Snag co-wrote for the 50th anniversary in the early 70s. Those vintage years of radio, that was John Ah. Snag book. And at the end of that book, Snag goes on a great rant, basically, about how the BBC is dead and gone and it's gone to hell in a handcart. And, you know, we'll never have the good old days back again. And basically, he he writes the obituary for the BBC at the end of that book. And he's writing in 1972, an era which most people now would regard as a, a halcyon golden age, the sunlit uplands of the BBC. And he was, as far as he was concerned, he'd been there since the late 20s. It was finished. Well, stick a fork in it, it's done. Do you know the story it's, about him and Roscoe? Go for it. I don't know if it was the launch day of Radio 1, but certainly in the, the very early uh, days of uh, Radio 1, uh, um, Snag is walking along the corridor at Broadcasting House and in comes Roscoe in some sort of uh, shaggy fur coat of some sort. And uh, apparently Snag shuffles past and looks around and says, You see that? That man was wearing a bloody carpet! That's that. So this is Emperor Roscoe. Who, yes, who Emperor. Sorry, on... I sort of clarified. Yeah, who's been yeah, on no, the show? He, of course, he's been on the show. Yeah, he's yes. been giving us some of his memories of, of starting Radio One. They're on day one, as I recall. Tony Blackburn was the Neil Armstrong, and then you had some shared one and two shows. The next yeah. Radio One pure show was my great friend and colleague Keith Skews, Buzz Aldrin of Radio One, as we like to call him, the second man on um, with Saturday Club, which uh, they'd taken off Brian Matthew. To, uh, to give to Keith Skews. And I don't think Brian Matthew ever quite forgave Skewsy that they, they took it off him for the launch of Radio 1 and gave it to Skews. And then I think, yeah, then Roscoe was on after Skews. Because the only bit, sadly, of Skews's show on the opening day of Radio 1 that survives is the end as Skews is doing his closing announcement because someone had put the tape on to, to record Roscoe after him. And you've, um, you've worked with Keith Skews with uh, BBC Radio Norfolk for some time, haven't you? Yes, I was very fortunate to be his his broadcast assistant for sort of. I did it regularly for a couple of years in the late two thousands, sort of oh seven to oh nine, and then up until he retired uh, last year, I would regularly come back and deputise and help out with special programmes. One of one of the really nice ones that I was able to do with Skews is that uh, uh, for the fiftieth anniversary of Radio One, sadly for reasons I don't know why, I think just because they were idiots they didn't ask Keith to be on the special Radio 1 pop-up station but uh, uh, he was able to go down to Radio 1 for that 50th anniversary weekend to uh, do his show his uh, BBC Eastern Counties regional show he did a Sunday night late show that was shared among the BBC local stations in the east of England and uh, we were able to go down and do that show from Broadcasting House on the Radio 1 50th anniversary weekend which was very nice it does seem like we're reaching that point now where those people who were there at the start are now uh, retiring gracefully or gracelessly whichever it might be it's sort of Tony Blackburn still broadcasting regularly, but it's not, you know, it's the end of that era. Um, yes, I, I suppose you must find that, I guess, I don't know if you've looked into this yet or if it's something you happen to know, but I suppose you, you'll you'll start to find that with 
the originals. I mean, I know you've talked about the founding four. Who who was the last of them who was left? Well, yes, yeah, so the first four, uh, well, Reese, you know, left in 38. Arthur Burroughs, who we've talked a lot about on the podcast, who uh, only lasted a few years at the BBC, who's moved to European, had up European radio, really, by the late 20s. Cecil Lewis stuck around no longer than Arthur Burroughs, really. And Major Anderson, the, the first secretary, only lasted a few months. So in that sense, yeah, Reith was the yeah. just the last of those first four. And and when he went in, in 38, that was the end of that era. Reith's but, a fascinating but, character, isn't he? The man who uh, didn't seem to like anything, because there, there is that sort of perception we have of him, isn't there, that he would have liked us to have all sat on spikes listening to church services all day and, and nothing else. From his diary on December the 31st. I had told Burroughs my first order to him that we would observe Sundays and that we should ask Dr Fleming of Pont Street to give a short religious address tonight. Early that evening for the children, Baden-Powell gave a message to the scouts. The original listings then say that the New Year's Eve broadcast closed after a concert. The bedtime was at 10.30. But as New Year grew nearer towards the end of December, a plan formed to stay up late. But it was a Sunday, so forget dance music, John Reith knew what he wanted. This is London Calling. Reverend Archibald Fleming, DD, of St Columba's Church of Scotland, Pond Street, is going to give the first broadcast New Year's Eve address. Yes, the first order of Reith's reign to engage in end-of-year watch-night religious talk from Reverend Dr Archibald Fleming of the Church of Scotland, London branch. We know exactly what he said and exactly what he sounded like. To be the last in the year 1922 to speak to you is a responsibility before which the most confident might quake. For you are about to transship from the vessel which bore you across the sea of 1922 into that which is now to carry you over the uncharted waters of 1923. And to me is given the opportunity of advising you what to take along with you, and what you had better leave behind. Many thousands who are at this moment invisibly grouped in this wonderful whispering gallery will never reach the end of the New Year's voyage at all. What shall we take with us from ship to ship? Just before midnight, a solo hymn was sung, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. Not exactly the upbeat dance music that some may have tuned in for. Then, of course, there were no Big Ben chimes. But there were Burroughs and Stanton Jeffries' tubular bells in the studio. Popular wireless magazine. Two of those chimes sounded the hour and then gave a lifelike imitation of the local belfry in full swing. The peals came out excellently on a loudspeaker. And the bagpipe solo must have been a joy to any Scotsman listening in. Oh yes, there were bagpipes from Mr R Marshall, an actual piper in the studio at Marconi House, alongside Mr Kenneth Ellis, who sang Old Lang Syne. Two of musical director Stanton Jeffries then announced in the new year, then handed over to Arthur Burroughs, who gave these words. Hello everybody, 2LO, the London Broadcasting Station speaking. We hope you have enjoyed our little concert. I expect this is the most original way of passing watch night you have ever experienced. 2LO wishes you a happy and prosperous new year. May you have the best of luck. Goodbye everybody, goodbye and the best of luck. The Boston Guardian said, At Marconi House, the memory of Mr Burroughs' greeting will long be remembered as our first New Year greeting over the ether. And from the Daily Herald. On New Year's Eve, the proceedings were lengthened until the New Year came in. The twelve strokes of midnight and chimes to follow were produced in the concert room and heard from Cornwall to the Shetland Isles. Our representative was shown the two news bulletins of the same evening. Each of these took about 15 minutes to transmit. The matter consisted of severely summarised news items of all kinds. Here are the headings. Reparation Conference. Quiet Week at Luçon. Mutiny in Italian Barracks. The Royal Sunday. Fatal motor car accident at Richmond. Cricket in South Africa. Bolshevik mystery ship. Gun running in Southern Ireland. Newcastle by-election. Scots at the Cenotaph. Outrages against British in Egypt. New Year weather in Australia. Passing of the year in Dublin. Irish railway notices. First German commercial aeroplane in London. Germs in test tubes. Oh, how far we've come. On weekdays, markets and stock exchange reports and sporting items are included with football results on Saturdays. Weather forecasts supplied by the Air Ministry are broadcasted with each bulletin. 
Uh, the Pall Mall Gazette noted a week later the novelty of enjoying New Year's entertainments without leaving your home. Those who have had a wireless set installed in their homes had no need on this last New Year's Eve to leave their own firesides to take part in celebrating the arrival of the New Year. They were afforded the opportunity of listening to a first-class Sunday night concert with an address by a well-known London clergyman. On some evenings, dance music is included, and many listeners in, provided there is a loudspeaker attached to the set, indulge in dancing. On Sunday last, it was a delightful, long and wonderfully interesting evening, and all without leaving your home to participate in it. So that was New Year. Let's check in with our guest this week then, radio producer and author Paul Hayes, whose book on the inside story of how the BBC brought back Doctor Who is called The Long Game. There's various elements. Obviously it picks up in the aftermath of the TV movie and why that didn't go any further and speaking to Alan Yentob and uh, Joe Wright, who was the BBC's executive producer on it, about that. And uh, the drama department changes hugely. The BBC drama department in the late 90s, I mean, this is no great revelation. I'm not risking my BBC day job by saying this because it's been written about extensively elsewhere. BBC Drama Department was in a bit of a mess in the late 90s. Nobody wanted to run it. Uh, when Charles Denton left as head of drama in 96, they went for about a year without anybody being in charge of the drama department because nobody wanted the job. Uh, in Georgina Bourne's book, Uncertain Vision, uh, which I'm sure you'll make great use of when you're 90 and you're doing the early 2000s, um, uh, she writes extensively about how um, every drama person of any note in the country was asked to come and be head of drama and didn't want the job uh, I mean there's a quote Russell T Davis in 2000 did an interview with a magazine called Cult Times about the status of his Doctor Who proposal at that time I was involved with the BBC about Doctor Who and he said in that interview he said uh, if it does happen I would only write for it I would never produce for the BBC I would rather die which is obviously an exaggeration but gives you a, a flavour of how the BBC drama department was maybe regarded at that time but Come to 2000's a big watershed year. Greg Dyke comes in. Uh, he gets the benefit of the new licence fee settlement that John Burke was able to negotiate before he went. He pumps an extra £100 million into BBC One. Lorraine Hegarty comes in as controller of BBC One. Jane Tranter comes in as the new head of drama, or controller of drama commissioning, as, as the title then was. Uh, as with all of these things, the BBC changes titles a lot down the years for what's effectively the same job. Um, but uh, yeah, 2000's a watershed. And, and, and then the drama department of BBC One become much more confident. Um, this isn't directly related to Doctor Who, but, but but sort of ties in in the sense that the news gets moved to 10. So finally, the BBC can run 9pm primetime dramas, which they'd never been able to do before because they either had to be suitable to run before 9 or they had to start late at 9.30 because the 9 o'clock news was there. They launched this slew of successful dramas, uh, Judged on Deed, Waking the Dead... Um, uh, new tricks, spooks, hustle, these all come along. Um, a lot of independent productions, of course. This is something that's changing during this era. Uh, obviously, the 1990 Broadcasting Act had specified the BBC had to have 25% of its output made by independent production companies. The BBC themselves had decided a third of all um, network money should go on productions made outside of London. So the central London drama department, which would, you know, a few years beforehand been making all of nearly all of BBC's drama was suddenly making you know less than half of it and yeah. so it's huge changes in the way that uh, British television and particularly BBC television drama were made One last thing to report for late December 1922 in our story. It's actually nothing to do with broadcasting at first glance. This is the time that poet Vita Sackville West meets Virginia Woolf at a dinner party. Now, this would be the start of a decade-long on-off affair between the two writers, part of the Bloomsbury set. And years later, one Hilda Matheson would become embroiled in this love triangle just as she joins the BBC as its first head of talks. Hilda Matheson would go off with Vita Sackville West, but at the same time be booking Virginia Woolf as a guest on the BBC in the late 1920s. But that's all yet to come. At this stage, Vita meets Virginia. The rest will be told in a few seasons' time, I'm sure. But that's season two of the British Broadcasting Century. Thank you for joining us on this. And season three, wow, it's really going to kick off then. The BBC will be booming. We'll see the workforce grow, the first female employees, the first opera, the Sykes Inquiry, the first Radio Times editions will come in. 1923 is the year that really makes the BBC. Next time, though, our special on the story so far. 36 episodes condensed into half an hour. If you've heard the History of England podcast special we did for them, you would have heard most of next episode already, but I've added a few 
extra special clips just for you that I think you're going to like. Some of them I have not put on here before. And when better to put out that special than November the 14th, 2021, the 99th birthday of the BBC. I thought we had to celebrate somehow, and the story so far seems a good way to do that. Meanwhile, thank you for joining us through Season 2. Season 3 will begin almost instantly. You'll barely notice the join. Thank you to Andrew Barker, the newspaper detective, for helping so much with this episode's research. And thank you for supporting us on Patreon, on coffee.com, slash Paul Carenza, which is a way of tipping me a price of a cup of coffee if you fancy. You can join us on Facebook or Twitter, find our groups and profiles there. And hey, tell your friends, because from next episode onwards, as I record this, it will be the BBC's 100th year. Yes, the BBC will be gearing up for their celebrations and we've got plenty to bring you on here too. Plus, if you've joined us on Facebook and Twitter, you may have spotted that I'm doing a play soon, a one-man play throughout 2022. I've got about a half a dozen dates already and I'm sure will be building up many more as well. So you can find details online. It's called The First Broadcast. The fabulous Museum of Comedy in London have already put their tickets on sale. I'll be there in April 2022, but also on November the 14th, 2022, the 100th birthday of the BBC. So you can get your tickets now for a year and a bit ahead and join me to celebrate the BBC's 100th birthday in the Museum of Comedy, which is full of wonderful comic memorabilia from the last 100 years. Linking the era we're currently talking about in, in the podcast to Doctor Who, the link I found was Eric Mashwitz. A last word then from our guest this week, Paul Hayes. Yes, Eric Mashwitz. People usually say he was the head of light entertainment when he did this. He wasn't the head of light entertainment. He'd stopped doing that. But he was the assistant and advisor to the controller of programmes. And in early 1962, Eric Mashwitz asked the BBC's script department under Donald Wilson to look at the possibility of the BBC making a a science fiction programme. I mean, that's the, the very first document in the Doctor Who file is the script department's report that they prepared for Eric Mashwitz. Sadly, Mashwitz's memo doesn't survive. But uh, when I was when I was uh, researching Donald Wilson's life for an article I wrote about him, I, I was able to go to the BBC Written Archive Centre at Caversham, and uh, you know it, it um, feels like you're Howard Carter, you know. So I can see wonderful things, and uh, uh, you know, opening this file that's got those original documents in, and right at the start of the file is this report that Eric Mashwitz commissioned looking at what sorts of things were popular in science fiction at the time. And so Eric Mashwitz, who'd uh, been involved in the early days, he went in 1962 as the uh, advisor and assistant to the controller of programmes. And it's, it's odd to think, because, yeah, he started in 1926. So, again, not there at the very start, but he was there in the company days before it became a corporation, just about with the variety department. I and mean, it was just radio. And uh, from, I think, In Town Tonight was his very first thing. And then left the BBC, wrote um, famous songs and Hollywood films. A Nightingale sang in Berkeley Square, I think. There you are, yeah. What a career that is that starts off with the launch of radio pretty much. Nightingale sang in Berkeley Square, Hollywood, comes back, goes, "Eh, let's have a sci-fi, and then Doctor Who appears. There is another link as well in that I mentioned there Don Wilson, who was the head of the script department in the early 60s. He then became the head of serials after after Sidney Newman came in and rearranged him. Don Wilson's the... uh, the co-creator of Doctor Who, never gets as much credit as Newman. I think he deserves more credit than Newman, but, you know, that's an argument for another day. But anyway, Don Wilson, his sister, Joyce, I think it was, Joyce Wilson, was Reef's secretary uh, during the Second World War. Oh. And on one of the BBC history pages, there's, uh, there's a story about uh, uh, Reef and, 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 and Joyce Wilson, and I think uh, there, there was some issue about whether she could be transferred from... Um, the army to the navy or vice versa to work to work with reef this memo that was written saying um i will not have my officers shunted around for the benefit of lord reef who has rather late in life discovered the art of <clears throat> there's an f word there that we can't say nice. but it's there on the bbc <laughs> website if you want to go and look it up there you are there you are what would reef say with that level of filth on the bbc website yeah, exactly shocking. yes shocking the book is the long game 1996 2003 the inside story of how the bbc brought back doctor who its author is Paul Hayes, the BBC radio presenter, producer, the man I've been talking to here. Oh, and I should say as well, because my publisher will kill me otherwise, that if you'd like a copy of the book, it's available from the website of Ten Acre Films. Just look up Ten Acre Films uh, and, uh, and you'll find out how you can get a copy. There you go. Ten Acre Films. That's where to go for the long game. That's the book. And I'm sure you'll come back and tell us about whatever your next project may be. Because well, sure be if I'm kind, if I'm lucky enough to be invited, that'd be that'd be very kind of you. Thank Absolutely. you very much, and and keep up the, the fantastic work with the podcast. Always a hugely enjoyable listen. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. 
The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. The original music is by Will Farmer. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at BB Century. You won't find us on the BBC website, though, because we are nothing to do with the present-day BBC. Archive clips are generally public domain, being as old as they are, but those that belong to the BBC are used with kind permission. BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation, all rights reserved. Similar with those press cuttings. It's an old defunct magazine that's nearly a hundred years old, but we thank the original long-gone journalists and all those who have made telling this origin story of British broadcasting possible. Stay informed, educated and entertained, and join us for the specials between season two and three of the British Broadcasting Century.